Settled by the Dutch in the 17th century, Brooklyn, New York was incorporated as an independent city in 1834. On January 1st, 1898, after a long political campaign and public relations battle, Brooklyn was consolidated with neighboring cities and towns to form what we know now as the city of New York, and it became one of the five boroughs. Flash forward to 2021, and it is the most populous county in the state, the second most densely populated county in the country. And if it's considered unto itself as a city, it ranks third behind Chicago and Los Angeles. Famous born and bred Brooklyners include Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Anthony Fauci, Howard Schultz, and Jay-Z. Ask any Brooklynite the impact it had on them and the answers I most often hear is, you can take the kid out of Brooklyn, but you can't take the Brooklyn out of the kid. One such born and bred Brooklynite that came into my life is named Michael Morale, a career Wall Streeter who navigated twists and turns up his career mountain to become CEO of a company called M Science. He is a pioneer in data-driven research to help companies make critical investment decisions. An early adopter of alternative data in the investment process, he has led and become one of the largest data-driven research organizations globally. And he combines the best of data science, the best of Wall Street, analysis, intuition to help other companies uncover valuable insights and to help them to make profitable investment decisions. Michael Morali, it is a pleasure to have you here on this show and welcome to A Climb to the Top. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's always I good love, to have that. I love the Brooklyn history. Well, I appreciate that. And when, when I met you through a mutual friend, it seemed to me your childhood formed in Brooklyn was an interesting part of either what you determined to decide to do or not. And I think it's a really interesting story. So, Michael, I think the best place to begin, even before we get into the company, is really your genesis, the beginning of the journey. Um, where was there throughout the course of your childhood as you thought about what your future was going to be, knowing there's this big Wall Street thing on the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge? As you grew up, what were you thinking about what you were going to be? Yeah, I think the, the Brooklyn thing is really interesting because uh, – I do value it. And I, I, I take a lot of pride in my childhood and the type of upbringing that I had. I think it was, I think I was one of the last of an, of an era of uh, kids that grew up with that, that very Brooklyn lifestyle, which included walking to school, which included just groups of young children playing sports outside, you know, without play dates, without pre-scheduled uh, parents involved in scheduling pickups and drop-offs. It was really special in that regard, but I didn't know it at the time. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you know, when I was doing things like uh, cleaning my own school on a Friday night, because my dad was the night janitor at our, uh, our elementary school, or delivering mail with him in the Brooklyn neighborhoods, uh, I just knew I wanted to go to school, learn a lot, and be quote unquote successful, but I had no idea what that meant. So like many children of the 70s and 80s, more so the 80s, um, <clears throat> I attached what success means or meant to me at the time, uh, essentially is making a lot of money, right? So, <laughs> so as that, a that's an easy way to define it. Yeah. So as a byproduct of that, that, that connection there, uh, I decided I wanted to work on Wall Street. And, and again, I didn't know what that meant either. I knew no one in finance uh, other than my uncle, who was a banker at Citibank. Uh, but in general, didn't have any of the connections or contacts or really any sort of understanding of what people on Wall Street actually did. Um, so I, I, you know, I started studying. I got a subscription to Business Week when I was 10 years old. And I started really just trying to learn about the markets and, and various things about the economy. And I remember learning very simple things like GDP and you know, some macroeconomic indicators. Wasn't actually trading uh, securities, but uh, really got into it and started learning a lot and became a voracious reader. Ultimately, uh, did win some stock picking competition <laughs> as, a, as a high schooler, right. um, which was great and very confidence inspiring. Uh, and then attended Binghamton University 
with, uh, with a major in accounting, always knowing that I wanted to end up in the capital markets, but just felt that an accounting degree would give me better fundamentals uh, versus a finance degree. And, and I, I went down that route. What's really funny though about this whole thing, Chuck, is that as I was preparing to graduate high school, I made a concerted effort to lose my Brooklyn accent. <laughs> And, you can take the kid out of Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I just had this thought that maybe it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be favorably received. And uh, I've met so many people with Brooklyn accents that are incredibly successful. And yeah. so it was like this thing, like I wanted to kind of put it in the past and move forward. But it's something now in my, you know, older years, uh, I really, I really value and hang on to. And I would never look to kind of move past what the, the what I view as really just a gift um, that I was given in where I grew up and how I grew up and and never never wanted for for anything other than just to to be outside play with my friends be close to my family eat my mom's cooking didn't feel like I was ever missing out on anything very grateful and and and, and fulfilling childhood yeah no I, I must say every time every night we turn on the television we hear a Dr. Anthony Fauci, born and bred in Brooklyn, we hear that Brooklyn accent. And it really, but but it brings me a sense of warmth to know that there were guys like you, now Fauci is probably 20, 30 years ahead of you, but they bring the Brooklyn with them. And to you, when I met you, it seemed to me, you took great pride, even though your father was certainly not of Wall Street, but you learned the ethic. And it, it seems if nothing else from your parents, you learn there's no shortcut to this top. You you earn it. Did you get that or acquire that ethic from your parents? Yeah, I got it primarily. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and worked incredibly hard raising us. Right. Uh, but my dad also had two full-time jobs. So right. he would literally finish an eight-hour job in like four to six hours and then go work another eight-hour job. And right. It was just, you know, seeing that, that work ethic that I just, I didn't, I didn't really know there was another way, right. right? Other than just working really, really hard. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, when I did start my professional career, I just worked really, really hard, like nights and weekends and just assume that was the way to do it. <laughs> well, you, you brought the only way you knew how. Right. So let, let's say we have many Wall Streeters who listen and many of my students, especially who are interested, particularly my financial engineering students. Many of them are into the world now of study in this discipline that when you and I went to school probably didn't exist this thing called data analysis. And I want to get there because I think it's an important mark of where you are both in your career and in the world. But help us understand your journey to Wall Street. So give us some time and context. When you went into the Wall Street world, you started somewhere. Help us, help us with the evolution. Yep. I started working with high net worth individuals, helping them structure portfolios and, and plan their financial lives. Right. Uh, I did have some exposure to working with some hedge funds early on, and that's where I really got excited and, and, and passionate about helping institutional investors uh, make a difference for their customers, you know, which ultimately are pension funds and, and, uh, <clears throat> and major institutions. So I uh, started with, with individuals, progressed to institutions, and, you know, just, just really, uh, Loved what I was doing, but also sensed that the business was changing quite considerably. And that a lot of the roles that had existed in, in say, prior to 2000, 2005, seven, around that time frame, were kind of going away with the emergence of technology. And so tech was something that I always really was interested in from a stock and company perspective, but not from a career perspective necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then I had the opportunity in 2000, 9, 10, 11 uh, at RBC, the Royal Bank of Canada, to work very closely with a development team that was actually pioneering a new way uh, to trade stocks electronically. And what they did, there was actually a book written about it by Michael Lewis called Flash Boys. Right. right. And, and so while I was not a character in the book, I was, I was very much involved and close to the story. I actually preferred not to be 
a character in the book, but because I had gone to a competitor by then. But uh, the key was that even in 2010 and 11, after what had occurred over the prior 10 or 20 years, and everyone thought that the markets would never be the same and they changed so dramatically and were so disrupted by technology, there was still a lot more to do. And so this concept or idea that like, you know, you can't change or disrupt industries more than they've already been disrupted, I, I think proved itself untrue. And so when we did that, and we, we did that with a lot of fanfare, obviously a book was written about it. Uh, it really made me think that every time that I feel like I'm late to a certain theme or, or technology or, um, <clears throat> or an evolution, uh, it's not too late. And there's always more work that can be done and more innovation and more creativity that can be applied. And so in 2012, I, I uh, took my own advice, so to speak, and I joined a company called ITG, which had recently acquired two research firms that were doing their work entirely based on data. And the, the role was to go over and essentially manage those businesses. And I had a lot of background working with companies and data. Uh, and I just viewed it as the future of our industry, right? Using data to inform uh, portfolio managers and analysts around company performance, but also using data to help companies manage their businesses more efficiently. And I thought it was going to be the next big thing, like in 2013. And I was shocked that it wasn't. It wasn't just lifting off immediately. And so that's where I really learned the, the concept of just duration and, and, and playing the long game. Right. And understanding that success is not necessarily overnight even if you have an amazing idea there's an op there's a possibility and in this case we were too early for the marketplace right they just weren't ready for what we were doing right and they it turned out they weren't truly ready un until like 2017 2018 which was when our business really started taking off we had become part of jeffrey's uh, M Science is a portfolio company of Jeffries, and we had a lot of support, a lot of funding, a lot of just uh, goodwill from the team over at Jeffries in helping us build our business. So I think that really played a, a critical role in our success. But at the same time, we were just early. And uh, well, and what was there had to wait. Well, a couple of questions I want to get, particularly if the space between 13 and 17 was you're waiting to see. Before I get to the inciting event question, is what you're describing taking both the bias and the intuition out of investing? It's not. That's a great question because at the end of the day, we have humans that are analyzing the data. Right. And you know, everyone always said, why, why do you have all these people? Right. You, you're a Don't data. Do you have person. machines? Right, right. Yeah. And what we've determined is that. AI and machine learning is not where it needs to be quite yet. And, and we are a long ways from re replacing humans. What we did, however, though, was we kind of changed the types of people that we started hiring. So we started hiring, if you think about a research analyst and their skill set, it's usually studying finance, learning uh, you know, a variety of things. But we hired data, science, data scientists who also understand finance. Right. Right. And those people are becoming more and more available within the marketplace, but there's still a lot of scarcity value on what they do. And so we've got a company of people that are either primarily technologists or primarily research analysts, but the technologists understand companies and data and the research analysts understand technology and data. So where everybody cross connects is, 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 is with data. And some, some of our people just understand companies really well. Some of our, our, our people understand technology and, uh, and information flow very well. And when you combine that, you get a beautiful thing, which is insight. So the ability to extract insight from data is not something that, that we can buy out of the box yet today. It may exist a decade or two from now, but there's still a tremendous human element in what we do. And, uh, and there will continue to be for quite some time. And does that insight suggest that the human beings involved in creating the insight are relying on the, the more qualitative measure, measures to either form an opinion or at least opine on the state of a company? 
Yeah, I think it's less intuition. We, we, we have, we have, our goal is really to eliminate bias right. and human bias, right? Yeah. So we don't have stock recommendations or ratings. We don't have price targets. For our corporate clients, we don't have any preconceived notions or biases about how their business is performing or how they can run it more efficiently or who their competitors are or should be or will be. <clears throat> um, we really want to just give a very clean, pure data-driven view or tell a data-driven story to our clients. And what would, give us an example, what would that look like? And, and let, me, let me back up. For context, Michael, you grew up in a world where when, if Morgan Stanley wrote about a company, there, there were three words, either buy, sell, or hold. And, and yep. it was an easy, accessible thing. You could even dismiss all of the things that were written. And if they said buy and you, you liked it, you'd buy it. You're suggesting there's something else here. What does that look like? You know, it's just another way to use information to learn about what's going on. Like we philosophically, if you look at the way that a portfolio manager picks uh, his or her investment uh, targets or candidates, you have an idea, you like a product, you talk to people that use that product. Maybe you visit a store or a factory or a site, build a financial model buy the stock or buy the bond, hope for the best. Um, get an update every 90 days, right? Every quarter. Yeah. We think that in, the, in this world that we're living in, where information travels you know, at the speed of light, that investors should actually have more visibility in, into how companies are performing. And so what that looks like is, you know, really things, understanding things that are occurring in businesses that are critical to an investment thesis, such as, when Walmart got into groceries, when Walmart got into the grocery business, it was a huge uh, investment thesis that if Walmart could actually execute on that, on their, their plan, on their strategy, that the stock would go up considerably. We had the ability using credit card transaction data and anonymized receipt data to see what people are actually buying without ever knowing who the buyer is. Um, but just that visibility into what people are buying, how much they're spending, how frequently they're going to Walmart, we were able to see in very short order the fact that the grocery business was working and it was working in a very meaningful way. And so we were able to deliver that to our clients. Our clients were able to profit from that major trend that is actually still playing out in Walmart stock, which is the, the power of the grocery business. Um, it's just an example. There are thousands of examples like that. But it's to see things that historically we weren't able to see. We would wait for the Walmart conference call, and then management would say the grocery business is performing well. Right. And we would say, okay, you know, let's look through the numbers to verify, trust but verify, right? <laughs> right. With data, we don't really have to trust. Right. We verify, but we, we know the outcome because it's empirical. Gotcha. Now, let me switch to the more qualitative measures. And this is more Michael, who became a CEO. What is it like to run a data-driven company in a modern virtual world? It's really, really uh, gratifying, rewarding, and frustrating. Right. All of, <laughs> all of the above. Right. Well, let's get to the rewarding and gratifying. Give us a sense of M Science for those who don't know your company. Size, where are you? What, uh, we'll, be what about 200, we'll be about 200 people by the end of this year. Yep. We are currently right in the, in the mid 170s. Mm -hmm. And that number is up by almost twofold over the past year and a half. So during you know, the, the period which started with quarantine and lockdown, we were able to hire 85 people remotely, which wow. is just in the incredible. COVID world, you doubled. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Which yeah. I think lends credence even more to your value proposition. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I do think that what happened in the first and second quarter of last year, when companies couldn't provide guidance, when investors really had zero visibility into how companies were performing. Uh, it did create, uh, an, an, a, 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 I would say, a new level of demand for the work that we do. Right. And I think what it's actually done is pulled forward a lot of that demand that probably would have played out over a three to five year period, pulled it all forward into like 2021. 
And whereas for the past 10 years or so, I've been evangelizing for data, for the use of data in running your business, whether your business is an asset management firm or you manufacture hand, uh, iPhones. I don't really have to do that as much anymore because everyone realizes that they need a data strategy in order to effectively run their company. Right. And so we've been a beneficiary of what's gone on over the past uh, 18 or so months, 15 or so months. Uh, the rewarding part is watching people grow and, 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 and learn and turn into leaders themselves. Right. And, you know, I was told at a very early part in my career that once I got into leadership, I, the, my success or failure would be determined by who I brought onto my team. And I was fortunate enough to have that advice because I, I still use it every day. You know, the people on our team, especially the people that report directly to me and then have their own teams that report to them, I have to get those hires right. And I do, I still make mistakes at times, but I'm so happy about where our team is, our management team is today, but every person is, is so important to the success of our company. Right. And that's why we do more reference checks and more interviews probably than a company our size typically would, mm -hmm. but we really want to make sure that we get the right people because once we do hire someone, we really lock into those people. We invest in them. We give them educational opportunities, wellness opportunities. Uh, and I'm, I'm almost to a fault. Uh, I'm, I'm always very eager to promote people. Uh, I'm agnostic to their, obviously their experience levels, but it all factors into their capabilities and skill set. But I was given a lot of responsibility personally at a very early part in my career. So I am predisposed to giving people responsibility as well. And it makes for a very exciting environment when people can climb the ladder, promote themselves essentially by contributing. And so we've got a, a lot of really young leaders. And if you look at our management team, it's half female uh, and it's, it's half under the age of 33 or four, I think. Um, That's fantastic. But in, in experience levels, it's essentially 10 years or so experience. And we have people running very large teams at those experience levels. And, and Mike, Michael, what have you learned about yourself over the course of these years as you've evolved as a leader? <clears throat> So I had never really failed in my career mm -hmm. up until I started managing M science. And that's not that <laughs> unusual <laughs> yeah. because most people will tell you, oh, the engineering, the data, that's pretty easy. The people, that's hard. Right. Is, right. is that what you were learning? Yeah, well, I remember like after our first year, I sat down with our board and I was like, I, I said, you know, I, I'm not, I don't really know how to handle this because I've never missed a target. Oh. I've never missed a target that I was given in my career. And at that point, you know, it was only, it was only five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had to get, I had to get comfortable with the, with, you know, your squiggly line with the arrow, yeah. which I love versus the straight arrow. Yeah. You know, success is not linear. Growth is not linear. Right. Personal development is not linear. Right. Or is the, the revenue trajectory or the profitability of a company. Right. And so the team at Jeffries was incredible in supporting me when I was down right. because I had missed some targets. And, uh, and that feeling of support and that understanding in speaking with other business leaders that growth is not linear really just kept me in the game and kept me sane. But I've, well, I've learned how to fail to answer your question. No, and that's a great one. And I think there's a, there's a lesson here for many of the idealists coming into the world. They're young, they wanna change the world. And your point and my point, I think what we both try to help people understand is the mountain is a zigzag. However, there's a lot of often emotional turmoil for people who are accustomed to succeeding 
only to have to adjust to what it's like not to be. How did it feel in that space when, oh God, I don't have this right. The board might be disappointed. What was that like? Scary. Yeah. Scary because, you know, that's where the intensity of the work, right? Because I had been programmed that if I work really hard, success will come. Right. But at a certain point, it, 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 I was being paid to think right, and not necessarily to work so hard. Well, you had to work smart. So your definition yeah. of what working effectively, I take it changed? It did for me, for yeah. me in my, in my role, right? Um, <clears throat> and I, I just, I really woke up to the fact that I am being paid to think. I'm being paid to set strategy, right? Uh, to make sure our employees are are happy and productive and challenged, so we retain them. Um, to be able to attract top tier talent to our company, to make sure that our clients are happy. But uh, most of that stuff is not directly done by me anymore, right? Right. So I have to figure out a way to scale myself. And take the good parts of what I had done with clients, what I had done with employees, and really try to scale that across our organization. But it was a major adjustment process for me. And it really started when I was just managing small teams also, not just large teams. Yeah. And one of the issues I had, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers are going to run into as well, especially those who are accustomed to high cal, really getting good results, um, was delegation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had this view that no one could do something as well as I could. Right. This is way back, you know, 15 or so years ago. Yeah. And a, a friend of mine said, well, if you're not going to delegate, you should just be a sole proprietorship. Right. Go, go right? open your candy store in Brooklyn. <laughs> Nobody exactly. can bother right. you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Michael, letting, go, letting go and giving responsibility to others was also a challenging thing that I had to get comfortable with. Yeah, what you're describing, Michael, you know, as a leadership coach myself to many financial institutions, many of my own clients, the common thread is early on in their careers, it was marked by their dogged determination to outwork everybody, right. and they knew it. But what happens is what I have found in my evolution as a coach, and I'd like your opinion on this, the majority of people are promoted up the mountain on the strength of their technical competence. Next thing you know, the promotions that are up for grabs have a job description that many feel ill-equipped, but in their own mind and in the mind of their superiors, well, you've earned a shot. So here you go. Right. Take it. Right. And then they get into that job and they said, oh my God, I have to delegate. I have to communicate. I have to collaborate. All of these things. Did you have that realization as you were heading up that mountain? Totally. Totally. I mean, it's a completely different skill set. Right. It's almost like a different person. It's a different job. It's a different job. In exactly. fact, you, you were not preparing for your job. Right, right. It, it, it's bizarre because the individual contributor gets the person to the, the management role. Right. right. The contribution on an individual level gets people promoted. And then they're asked to do all of these things that we've never really done before. Right. So it, it's interesting. I had a call today with one of our senior people. And we're actually talking about him being promoted into a larger role. Mm -hmm. But now, because of experience, we're going to take six to nine months to get him there. Right. Right. We're going to make sure that all the proper things are in place, that skill set, that different job. So we're not setting people up to fail because the, the best performers, the top performers are not always necessarily the top managers. Right. But before I, I do want to get to your future state, I want one other thing, and this is to our listeners. Now you can proffer some advice. If you were to tell these data engineers, scientists, all of those who would like to be in your shoes one day, what would you like them to think or at least to do in preparation for that mountain 10 years from now? Oh, you know, I can tell you where I see people fall down. Yeah, that so might the work. Best, the best coders, the best data scientists, the best engineers, if they lose sight of the practicality of what they're trying to do, mm -hmm. the real world examples or, or situations that they're working on with data, with coding, 
that's where we kind of get disconnected from reality and the ability to help our clients. Uh, or said differently, the ability to um, be commercial and, and really relate. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to create solutions for people that have problems. They're up against certain problems and we provide solutions. Those solutions are not um, siloed in just technology. So I've seen phenomenal data scientists and data engineers use com inject common sense and practicality into the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where success happens. Right. Um, so really being well-rounded, being well-read, having a good understanding of human behavior, human psychology, I think is critical for any role, even in technology. You know, the basics, organization, et cetera, that's what gets you in the door, right? The coding, we have a, we have a test that we give to our, 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 our new hire candidates regarding their, their skill set with regard to coding. Everything has to work though. It has to be, you know, everything that we learn in school about personal relationships, collaboration, uh, the team environment is more critical than ever, especially in this work from home environment, right? Everyone has to go that extra step to communicate. You know, it's, it's much harder to communicate when we're all at home. Well, which means you gotta be better at it. And, and I love that advice because if you looked at LinkedIn, Michael, and what in the soft skills, in, in, in the, the words that appear the most often, creativity is one. Number two is persuasion. Number three is collaboration. And number four is adaptability. Who knew? Who's teaching them that? And I, I would imagine you must lead by example, by picking up on those qualities. Is that important to you? Yeah, we look for that. Yeah, you know, we're, our, when we're hiring people, we're looking for the complete package. Right. Now, it's good to know because there are many, even my own students, what's my GPA? Is that my path to the top? Well, that's not a bad thing, right. but you're, you're suggesting, and I'm so happy to hear this, there's a whole nother layer if they want to work into the job. Michael, let me just, let, let's finish up with, there, this is a confounding world to say the least. And while you have, have, your mem science is proof positive of how you took advantage of the, the uncertainty in a COVID world to double your business. What does it look like in the future? Do you have a view of what your business looks like two, three years out? Yeah, I mean, two, three years is easy. If you ask me like seven to 10, I, I'd right. get a little squishy on the answer. But yeah, um, I, I think we're just getting started. I, I think if you... If you look at what happened in the 70s and 80s and part of the 90s with regard to hardware, and then you look at what happened in the 90s and the 2000s and, and really up until now with software, mm -hmm. hardware enables software, hardware plus software enables data. So I like to think of these in 15 to 25 year eras and having uh, had the hardware era which then progressed to the software era. I do believe that we are now firmly within the data era. Mm -hmm. I think that we're only several years into the data era. We're still in the very early stages and this will run out for the next couple of decades. And so for listeners, for viewers, or for, for people who are considering career paths, I, I think we have a lot of runway here in the world of data, data analytics, and really combining an understanding of financial markets or corporations and businesses with data and data, data science and analytics. So I'm incredibly encouraged. Like, I think I can do this job for another, you know, 10 or 20 years. And I think it's just going to get more exciting. I think we're going to see more and more talent come into our space. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also going to see bigger companies come into our space, right? Because the opportunity is real. And and there are, there are significant financial rewards to get this stuff right. right. You know, we're running a more efficient economy. We're running more efficient. Our markets are running more efficiently. Capital formation as a byproduct of transparency and an understanding of how businesses are performing and how we can help improve that performance is really driving a lot of value. It's creating a lot of value. It, it's eliminating a lot of waste and inefficiencies. So when I think about where this is all going, 
I think it's all about transparency and bringing that transparency to economies, to markets, and to companies. And in that, in that regard, we're still in the very early days. Well, so there is whatever we're in the data world, the next cycle 20 years from now will be something different. So you are now hiring. And if someone is interested and they're listening, hey, I'd like to work for this guy. Where do we find M Science? Uh, you can go to mscience.com. Pretty easy. We've got a new website launching in the middle of September. So, uh, you know. It looks good now, but it'll look even better. And and yeah, we're we're all over LinkedIn. We're yeah, you know, we're easy to find. Yeah, and it's easy to remember M Science, and particularly we've got a double M here. Michael Morali at M Science is easier. <laughs> well, Michael, now let's let's reflect the way we began. Brooklyn, New York, is a very different place. It is hipster. There is music. I think there is more culture. I think Queens has the most number of languages spoken in any one place, but I think Brooklyn has maybe the most diverse set of music, food, all of those. Do you go back to your Brooklyn roots? And if so, how does it feel? Uh, it's great. It's great to see what's happened in Brooklyn. I mean, I'm blown away when I see some of the, the structures and the hotels in Williamsburg. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a completely different demographic than the one that, that I grew up within, uh, but it's awesome. It's great to see. And, uh, you know, I've lived in New York for 47 years, my entire life. I've never lived anywhere else. And, uh, and I'm just hoping that, that New York, you know, regains it's everything that it was prior to COVID and beyond. But I also think that, uh, what's happening in New York is, is healthy in the sense that things are becoming a bit more affordable and it will allow people like myself who grew up with not a lot of financial means to experience the the, the wonder of new york so um i'm encouraged to see the seeing the new people moving into all of the five boroughs of new york and the and the surrounding area so it, it's an exciting time and you know we're, we're we're going to see over the next several years how things play out, but I, I think it's a very exciting time. And your enthusiasm is well on display and appreciated. Michael Morali, of CEO of M Science, thank you very much. You have offered some wonderful advice, certainly to all of our listeners, but how grateful I am for you to have been onto our episode, and I thank you for taking the time to do it. Thank you. I'm grateful as well. Thank you so much. You bet. This is Chuck Garcia of A Climb to the Top Stories of Transformation. We can be heard on C-Suite Radio, on Amazon, on Spotify, on Apple. Tune into us also on our YouTube channel and subscribe if you could. Always reach out to me at chuckgarcia.com or send me an email at chuck at climbleadership.com. Always a pleasure to hear from you. And I really appreciate all the comments that come in on the show. Michael, one more time, thank you again. We really appreciate you having me. Thank you, everybody.